the meantime, we're really excited to be hosting this conversation with Stephen here at the Council, and I'll now hand over to him to share the insights of his extensive experience in strategic leadership, and then Stephen will be joined by our relatively new CEO, Adrian Collette, in conversation, and we'd really welcome your questions during that part of the session. Thank you, Stephen. It's a real privilege to, to be with you today. Um, uh, as the staff here have learned, um, I love to talk. Um, so I'm going to try to, to limit the, the sort of at you part. I also have to move around to get a little bit of a cage panel thing going on um, if I stand behind the podium. Um, uh, and so don't get threatened if I come down um, from there, because this is, this is it from here. This is one of the things that I have a giant problem with in our sector. So just a little bit of the background that um, I think I might not have given Wendy. So I'm a, I have a master's uh, of fine arts um, in theater administration. Um, so I was meant to be a um, uh, theater manager. Um, when I was in graduate school, the thing that I learned was if I could figure out how to get the right mix of soda in the soda machine in the green room, I would have solved all of the problems of the theater company. And that just didn't seem to be where, where I fit. Um, so then I went and sailed in an America's Cup event. You guys have heard of those, right? Um, however, mine was 1980, so we won that time. Um, uh, and then we lost. Um, and, and then the sailing world changed, and that's a whole other story. Maybe anybody wants to talk about that's my effort. We'll talk about that. Um, I, I've been very, very fortunate in my career um, to have a, a kind of unique seat. Um, it's usually 25E right by the bathroom. But it's at this 30,000 foot level of getting to, to look at the field. And I was really lucky. I started when I was really, really young, so I've been around for a while. Um, I get a big kick now saying to people, so when I started in the last century, I mean, that's just kind of an interesting kind of conversation. Um, but the work I've had the privilege to do um, and the honor to do has exposed me to the, the, the most decent organizations and the longest established organizations in lots of places. Um, in the world, generally the Western world, generally the e English speaking part of it. So um, if I say something you don't understand, then maybe you should ask me. More it's more likely you'll say something I don't know what it means. But I did learn I'm really chuffed to be here with you guys today. Um, and my program is Chalkers. Um, so so um, hopefully that'll go, that'll all go, go pretty well. So the question is in, in a program like this, like, like where do you start? Well, well we're, in, we're in 2018, certainly in my lifetime, it's the most dynamic time of change, 2019 actually. Um, <laughs> so you see how dynamic is the year change that I wasn't paying attention. Um, the, the most dynamic period of change that we've experienced in a really, really long time with some pretty fundamental issues and questions. Um, social change, diversity, the role of the arts and culture in our daily lives, what is community, what is success, all kinds of questions. And as has been the case for all time, some of the questions are being answered and being addressed um, by artists and folks in the artistic sector. And so I thought it might be interesting um, to set this frame up, uh, this talk up in three parts. Um, there's a framing piece. Um, there's a piece about the role of cultural institutions, and, and Wendy alluded to some of our anchors work, and I want to clarify some of the vocabulary about that. I think that's important. Um, and then wrap up with what might success look like going forward. Now, 80% of my experience is North American. Um, my global experience is um, Australasia, Europe, um, a little bit of Eastern Europe, um, and not much in South America. Um, so, so I want to sort of acknowledge there are pieces of this that I don't know. And since I'm a professional consultant, I overgeneralize. Um, you're perfectly welcome to call me out um, on that as we go along. So um, the frame of this talk with you now is 1920, 21. 
And it's not a math problem, and it doesn't add up to 60, and 60 isn't an auspicious number that means anything particular. But it's actually a conversation about how we got to be where we are. So the 19 thought is about the content that we traditionally think about when we think about the arts and cultural space. And when you think about the major Western art forms, you know, 18th century, 19th century, there hasn't been a ton of change. There hasn't been a ton of change in form, there hasn't been a ton of change in delivery system, and there hasn't been a ton of change in who participates. The 20th century looks like, in the rear view mirror, that there was quite a lot of boom in our sector. Literally tens of billions of dollars invested in capital facilities for the arts around the world. Probably one of the bigger investments in any sector, and certainly for the not-for-profit arts and culture space as we know about it, the biggest time of investment and growth. But what's really interesting is that these 20th century spaces are now expected to deal with 21st century people. And the 20th century peoples are, first of all, not singular and monolithic, have all kinds of different interests and demands and starting points and connection points, and it becomes an incredibly, incredibly different set of conditions. So I began to think about, I began to think about when, when there's been all of this change, all of this growth, all of this, in theory, opportunity, um, where are we at? And, and why is there so much dynamic tension in the sector? Well, first of all, we got trained. How many, um, how many academically trained arts administrator types in the room? Actually, not a lot. How many learn in the practice of the streets? So my, my career started promoting um, touring Broadway theater and live boxing, right? And if you ever want to juxtapose two things that go together to figure out what it is like to, to attract people to an event, because um, the outcome of both of those things are known, by the way, right? We all know the story of all the American musicals anyway. It's always, you know, boy meets girl, boy breaks up with girl, boy gets back together with girl, they go off into the sunset. Then it changes, maybe it's boy meets boy or wherever it goes, but it's pretty much a standard story. Well, it turns out that live boxing, at least, right, the same thing. You know, person A comes in the ring, person B comes into the ring, they pummel each other for a while, but the one that was supposed to win wins. I don't know why it always works out that way, but it, it always seems to work out that way. I don't know why it works out that way. Um, uh, in the 20th century, what we trained arts administrators and arts makers um, was that central to their success was the clarity of their mission, what they did. Well, I think the 21st century is calling us on us to think, I'm sorry, very um, did us, did us suggest that we need to think about is not what we do, but why we do it. And purpose becomes much more important than mission. Mission doesn't go away, but why are we doing what we're doing becomes a really important thing. I think we need to really rethink our spaces. Um, our spaces for arts and culture as they were generally developed in the 20th century are not the kind of spaces that sort of inspire participation. Um, the term we use in our office is threshold anxiety. Um, it, it starts with the big performing arts centers of the 1960s and 70s, including the Sydney Opera House, including, including QPAC, and including uh, Art Center Melbourne, et cetera, et cetera, where if you look at the building, I mean, I still have this problem. Lincoln Center just spent $1.6 billion to address its threshold anxiety problem, and you still come to the curb, you look up at a marble and glass building with Chagall tapestries, through the windows and you say, was I supposed to wear a tuxedo? <laughs> and, and, and whether we built our buildings up on plinths, generally as islands or palaces of culture, which was a tragic thing that we did for at least half a century, maybe more. By the way, we didn't do that. We didn't do that 200, 400, and 4,000 years ago. We gathered around a storyteller in whatever place we happened, <clears throat> we happened to be in. So, so our, we really need to think about, about not just our spaces and how we design them, but actually how we animate them and how we, how we animate them. 
Um, and then we need to think about content, because content is everywhere now. Content can be made by anybody now, and we need to think about the characteristics of content that are really important. Um, earlier, talking with the staff here today, and when when we were when I was up at Cairns, Cairns, no R is in Australian language, in Cairns, um, uh, we had a really interesting conversation about the intersection between the live and the digital space. And it's not an either or connection, but I have to admit a bias. I'm a live guy. We could be doing this conversation just with me and the camera, and you could all see it. It would be nothing like what's going to happen here now. And we have to figure out how that's balanced in an environment where digital distribution of content is an everyday piece of life. I had the good fortune last night, I went to the Tim Minchin concert at the state. What a treasure you have there. Social activist, commentator, incredible artist, genius, quite frankly, I think. And the first thing he asked everybody was to shut off their phones. And he said, you all think that's because I want you to be present. And then he said something about maybe I don't want any recordings going around. So I'll leave that to you because you all understand the context of that better than I do. But, but, but how do we live in a world right, that lives in both spaces, that lives in a space of sort of immediate capacity, uncurated? How do we live in a space that, that is, wants to have reflection and interaction and conversation to go together? So, so the content thing, if, if, they're all, if they're all in motion for us, what does it mean? And what I want to postulate for you is that it means that success is being defined very, very differently than it was historically. So when I came into the business as a young professional in the latter part of the 1980s, um, what I was taught is that the reason I was at drama school was to learn how to make the best made play and deliver it in an excellent form. It was all about the art for the art's sake. In fact, the dean of my drama school said to our class of 65, you know, you're really lucky to be here, and when you graduate, you will go somewhere and start a theater company. I had to go, I raised my hand and said, where and why there? You know, a really sort of interesting, a sort of interesting question. So, so at least through what, I don't know, 1970s, 1980s, um, in the 20th century, because I can't go back further, um, our measure of success in our field, maybe a slight but not significant originality, was about excellence, art for art's sake. Um, as our sector grew and began to demand more resources, there was some really interesting economic work done, and, and the discussion was, well, you know, this is a kind of unproductive industry. Um, the only industry that uses more capital per unit of output is steel. Um, and by the 1980s and 1990s, we knew where that was going, right? Um, we couldn't figure out how to solve that in our sector. It takes 115 musicians to play for all. Um, so when people started looking for efficiencies in the system, um, this Danny Newman, is that a name that made it to Australia? He wrote a wonderful book called Subscribe Now. Um, this 450 page tune basically said, if you print 600,000 red and green brochures and you mail them all out and you get a 1.5% response, you'll be doing great. And the era of direct mail came around, the era of, the era of sort of shared services and other operating efficiencies that came around. And a lot of the folks who set policy in our sector really focused on that. They drifted from the art, and they started to focus on efficiency, whether it was government and state agencies here in Australia, our big foundations in America, uh, governments in, in Canada and Europe. What we realized was that being efficient actually didn't make us any more productive, and that the art didn't necessarily get a whole lot better, for maybe some more resources to be spread around. So the conversation shifted. <clears throat> the conversation shifted in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century as we became uh, more engaged in, open to, and willing to address the questions of uh, equity, of access, of diversity. Um, and, and the conversation shifted and started to talk about effectiveness. What is it that you're intending to do and how well are you doing? But it was still a what question. It was still a what question. And, and what I'd like to propose is that as our conversations get more sophisticated and as arts and culture gets to be part of a broader civic conversation, which is where we'll go next, that the 21st century, the second, fifth, the third, fifth of the 20th century is about entanglement. How can we make arts and culture so important to community that if it went away, it would actually be missed? It's 
spent a lot of time with, um, with indigenous and Torres Strait arts makers up in Cairns. And one of the things that I left with this time that, that was, was most touching to me was the notion about age-old songs, age-old storylines, and how they define communities. And I think that another thing that we lost in the latter part of the 21st century in our, in our arts and culture practice was that it depends where you are. It's about people. It depends who you're engaged with. We can't do the same thing everywhere. So if you, if you use these as building blocks, and, then, and if, you, if you say, we're not giving up on excellence, or quite frankly, I think a better word would be quality, because there can be quality at different scales. Um, that we want to certainly run good businesses and be efficient, but, but um, Jim Collins, um, good to great in the social sector, he's, he's another great thing worth meeting. Um, he wrote good to great, so he looked at 11 high-performing companies, he looked at their characteristics, and he said, I don't know why the rest of the world can't operate their businesses this way. Then he wrote a pamphlet about this big book, Good to Great for the Social Sector, and the first sentence it said was, those of you that are involved in public benefit businesses should not be evaluated the same way corporations are. They need to be evaluated differently. Then we moved on to this question of impact, and now, as I said, I think we're moving to entanglement, and we get a lot of really positive outcomes. We get a much more inclusive system if we think about community at the center of what we do. The diversity of the offer, the range of things that people are willing to engage and explore and offer and introduce grows. And in fact, public value increases. So we're going to have a probably a good debate about what public value means as a phrase. For me, it's the aggregate success of a place in every dimension of measure you can there's certainly an economic measure to it, there's a social measure to it, there's a cultural measure to it, there's even a familial measure to it. Is it a place that people want to be? And is it a better place? Um, there's a town here in Australia that I can't remember anymore, but I read a great story. Um, they, they were trying to decide what was the most important measure of knowing whether or not their community was vibrant. And their metric of KPI, which you guys are so in love with, was smiles per mile. They stood a city employee on a different quarter every month, and he just smiled, or she just smiled, at the people who went by. And they counted how many people smiled back. And if that number was higher than it had been the last time, then things were okay. If that number was lower, they started to look for the cause of that, of that decrease. It's just a kind of brilliant, brilliant idea. So how does this all relate to public value? So if, if we think about arts and culture in a public value framework, we have some great scholarship to refer to. Um, uh, Urban Institute um, did some really, really interesting stuff. What they showed us was that um, community vitality, which is another synonym for, for successful creation of public value, um, is a function of three strategies. The presence of opportunities for cultural expression, participation in those opportunities, and support for both the presence and the participation of those opportunities for cultural expression. Our sector, whether small organization or big organization, is uniquely positioned to deliver on all of those three things, because we do a bunch of things really, really well. We create content. We make programs. Absent the program, there wouldn't be presence or opportunities for cultural <clears throat> People come. Uh, I'm going to talk again at the end. Um, I, I'm banning the word audience or visitor from my vocabulary because it's really terribly passive and oh so 20th century. People come at 7.30, they sit in E7, um, they do what we tell them, we play the music, so please don't unwrap your sucker or read your program even though we left the lights on. Participants are much more active. They're we're engaged with and connected. The community benefits because there's no sector that does as well as we do in terms of encouraging civil discourse, um, encouraging socialization conversations, encouraging exploration and learning. Um, and then there are actually technical or instrumental outcomes like creating jobs and economic impact and all those sorts of things. So I, I think. The really good news to be in our sector right now is that we can draw a direct connection in the arts and culture sector 
what you do in life more generally. What we do to how we measure it, and we can demonstrate to leadership, to mayors, to councils, that we actually create real value. So, nice picture to make the segue to take a breath. Have a glass of water. So I want to talk briefly about anchor institutions. Um, is that a phrase that means much to anybody in the room? So anchor, anchor is another good word like entanglement. Most of you have a negative reaction to entanglement when I first brought it up. Most people do. I think it's a great word. It comes from physics, from quantum physics. Um, when particles are entangled in quantum physics, you can't tell the individual pieces from the whole. That's just a great idea. I love, having spent my career in the arts and culture sector, I would love to be in a place where I, I couldn't tell the parts from the whole. Anyway, there's a wonderful organization called the Anchor Institution Task Force, um, and they've defined a set of organizations um, that are in a particular place for a long period of time that are absolutely connected to the success and value of that place. It's generally educational institutions, medical institutions, governments, and the like. I did a project with Karen Brooks Hopkins who ran the Brooklyn Academy of Music for the last 17 years. She was there her whole career, 36 years, and she will tell you that Brooklyn is Brooklyn because of BAM. Now, the truth of the matter is BAM was in Brooklyn for 175 years, now 178 years, and maybe the 100 first 140 weren't so successful, but certainly for the last 36 years, it was an amazing institution. What, what the Anchor Institutions Task Force realized is that, that anchor institutions, and this is really important, align their core institutional purpose with place-based economic, human, and intellectual resources to better the welfare of the community in which the anchor resides. resides. We were interested to know whether or not that could apply to cultural institutions. So Karen became a senior fellow at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation when she retired from BAM. A bunch of us got involved to work with her on this really, really interesting project. Um, and we looked at only three places. So we want to talk about a generalization. We looked at three places and they are completely different. One was the big performing arts center in Newark, New Jersey, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. The second was the uh, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, which was an economic development project in, in western uh, Massachusetts where industry had fled the space and the governor was looking to get reelected. It's now the largest contemporary art museum in the world at over 600,000 square feet of space. Um, and then we looked at a little tiny organization in Providence, Rhode Island called AS220, um, which is an unjuried, uncensored, arts for all collective. Um, it's a wonderful study. You can Google it on the Mellon website or on SMU Data Arts. Um, but there were some takeaways that I think are important to our conversation. So one of the things that we discovered about anchor arts institutions and anchors is what they have in common are partnerships as a central tenant of how they deliver their work. Another thing that we learned, and unfortunately we didn't change our vocabulary until after we did this study, um, is that their audiences, their participants are very place-based. Not exclusively place-based. Some of them come as tourists to visit. You know, if you do Book of Mormon in Brisbane for 10 weeks, you can't get a ticket. People are coming from not just the state, but all over the eastern part of the, the eastern part of the country. Um, uh, and that the biggest finding is that the personnel, the staff, the board members, and the volunteers of these institutions are independent enablers of entanglement because they're generally people who are deeply involved in community. What's, what happens that's really interesting is when you build a map of the organization's partnerships, and the personnel's partnerships, you find some obvious overlaps, but you find three times as many new places where multiple people are engaged in community and the institution is not. That's opportunity waiting to be picked. We also learned some other things that maybe aren't quite so positive. Um, we learned that um, uh, decisions, I tried to write it in the positive because I tend not to talk that way, um, that, that that it would be better if decisions were made by evidence than inertia. 
So when we started asking questions about why do you do these partnerships, six out of 10 times, the answer was, well, because these are our partnerships. Okay, yeah, but why, why, not what? Why do you do what you do? Well, because these are our partnerships. Okay, so um, what do you do for those partnerships? Well, most of the time what we do for them is we give them space. Um, because as an arts and culture institution in the early 21st century, what we have a lot of is space. Um, it turns out we could, we, some people, there's other things that they give them. Sometimes it's professional personnel or marketing support. Maybe they actually partner on activity or lend some expertise, but you can't even read it. Very seldom that they actually make an investment do they give any funding into these, into these partnerships. And when we tried to dive deep into that particular branch of our map, we discovered that there was no correlation between the amount of financial investment and the impact. In fact, we found out that most people didn't know what the impact was. So in the end of the day, one of the really big differences between an anchor institution, a civic anchor institution, and what we think is an emerging opportunity for cultural institutions um, is that the, the civic anchors know why, and in our sector, we still know only why. So we need to change the conversation and to wrap up with the final, final part of this. I think there's four really big takeaways that I would, I would leave with you. Um, we need to start thinking in an active vocabulary as opposed to a passive vocabulary. Participant might not be the best word. I'm open to other suggestions. Um, but I know it's not audience. Right? First of all, that's incredibly transactional. Don't want to deny that it takes money to run our businesses and that there should be a value exchange. But, but participation is a much, more, a much more active word. We need to think about our spaces in a, in a way that we have it in the theater world in particular, but also in the museum world. You know, museums are interesting because they're kind of boxes that quite often they insert new configurations into. But in the end of the day, there's kind of still boxes. You know, when do they break through the wall? When do they, when do they go into the park? Um, uh, we need to think about spaces that are dynamic. And I'm not sure I've seen, I'm involved in a lot of building projects, a lot of building projects coming up on $10 billion. And I don't think we've seen a 21st century venue yet. I don't know what they are. I challenge architects all over the world to know what they are. And they get more decorated. They get more architectured, as I like to call it. Um, but I'm not sure we've solved that problem yet. Um, we need to think about purpose, not about mission. Why do we do what we do instead of what do we do? And then fourth, um, we really need, and this is the change that will make everything, everything different. We need to understand that governance is not a hierarchy. Governance is everywhere, and it's everyone. And until we, until we make it heterogeneous, until we make it inviting, until we engage broadly all of the peoples that we want to engage, we're, we're not going to become an anchor. We know a couple of the dimensions of what it is. We know the institution needs to be enduring, it needs to be anchored in time and in place, it needs to be entangled. We actually went so far, and I won't make you read it, um, to write a, a mission statement for what a cultural anchor institution means. I just want just to point out a couple of things. Um, this notion of diverse partnership directly and through personnel that we bring crucial and measurable benefits to that what makes up communities. And by the way, one of the things we do in the arts, which we, I mean, we should just learn from Edison, we've got to serve the field, we've got to help advance the field at, at all scales. Um, and that, that, that we have a two-pronged outcome, I think, that we're looking for, um, which is community building and knowledge sharing. And I hope that's part of why I'm here. So last thought, um, what are the benefits? Um, I believe that arts and culture can be seen um, right at the center of complicated community growth, complicated transformation. I think we're great storytellers. I think we're great connectors. I think we're amazing question askers. And I think we're really good at being thoughtful and activating. Um, I think communities are better, at least my personal experience, when arts and culture is at the table of significant, complicated, hard community questions. I think that we really, really benefit that. 
And at the end of the day, it doesn't mean you need to change your artistic vision. Now, I hear a lot in, in the contemporary conversation, which, which can be very much an either or conversation, which I don't, I don't think either they have the money or they have the money. Maybe how about like we have the money? You know, either they're the, they're the important institutions or they're the important um, and then you hear the, the, this whole thing about, well, in order to be available, accessible, engaged, diverse, connected, we have to dumb down the art. That's not true at all. All we have to do is share the art, because that's what we do better than, than anybody else. So with that, I think Adrian's going to ask me some really hard questions. Hopefully, you'll jump in and throw a couple of softballs at us. But thank you very much. It was a tremendous opportunity. sector to be really, really involved, engaged, and valuable. Thank you very much, Stephen. Where do you want to sit? We can sit on the steps, if you like. No, no, let's go. It would be too much like waiting for God over here. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Okay. So, I'll start with a couple of questions, but the interesting dynamic will be what comes from the room. Uh, and thank you very much for that. So I'll start with a couple, but please, uh, please think about what you want to ask Stephen. And we have about 30 or 40 minutes, um, so we should get on with it. Um, I've got a bunch of questions here, but as I was listening, a lot of things occur. I'm very taken with your notion of uh, we have to move from what to why, from mission to purpose. I'm very interested to know why, what is the why behind the why? Why have we become, if we have, and I suspect we have, so obsessed now with the why question? It was a real confidence to, this is what we do, and come and be part of it if you want to. But certainly, arts organisations and my former organisation, which was the university, thinking very hard about the why question. What is it about the contemporary society that is driving that? That was a big uh, sign. Well, that's one of the questions you told me. No. To be <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have a pretty narrow perspective, right? Arts and culture yeah, yeah. is what I know about. Um, I, I think I know about other things. I, I read a lot. I listen a lot. Um, I think it's because there isn't a singular answer to anything. There's many more perspectives. There's many more interesting questions. There's many more peoples that are engaging with the outcome. So there isn't a right answer. Um, and, and if you're going to do what, you know, think about the corporate world. Um, you know, all the all the text tells us that, that whether there's a demand or not, if you create a product, you can create that demand because you can you can get people to think they need to have something. Sugar and soda. Um, and, and there was a time uh, when in the more traditional Western, I have to stick with that Western arts and culture space, um, you did it because you were supposed to, if you were one of the people who were supposed to do it. And I'm, I'm going to stay away from some words that I think have been hijacked and I don't know if it's part of it. Um, nowadays, if inclusion, participation, engagement, community vitality are our goals, then, then the why question is really much more important. And the what actually turns into how, which is a very different, a very different equation. Thank you. Uh, um, really, I mean, it, it is, I think the contemporary context is changing at the speed of so. Uh, the only reason I labor the question is because it is, it is actually changing, as you say, the way people are thinking about their purpose which must mean it changes the way they're going about their business. You, you've been, when I looked at your work, you've been engaged with small and innovative companies, with large, what we might call heritage organizations in different parts of the world, a lot in America, of course. Can I ask you two simpler questions? Are there just some fundamental learnings you take out of that? You know, maybe three? That, that you think will stand us in good stead for the future? 
I'm looking for some certainty and change. Yeah. Yes, well, so I'm, I'm, I actually wrote down um, uh, two of them, and then I have a, uh, I think it's a parable. Um, so so what, what, what do I think we, we, we learn? Um, we have to embrace change. You've got to love change, because it's just not a static time anymore. And that's really hard. Right? In, in resource constrained organizations, by definition, change is hard. Um, and, and just a, another definitional thing, resources is, are not just money. It's leadership resource, which I happen to think is the scarcest resource, both, both lay leadership and professional leadership. And there's some real differences between, between particularly your governance structures here in Australia and ours in America, where I think we could look. Um, uh, it's also human resources, and, and in the 10, 12 days, 14 days almost I've been here now, a lot of conversation about capacity building and workforce development and training, and it sounds like there's a scarcity of skills for a sector that wants to be vibrant and growing. Um, uh, and of course money, right? Money's always a problem, but you know, except when we're in times of recession, and I think the first time I was here was, was right around the global financial crisis. And the scarcity of resources is a real question, but except for those moments, right? GDP growth, global GDP, is only on an up curve. So the conversation that I want to have is how do we grow the pot, not divide the pot. So that's one, embrace change. Um, second um, is that our business is full of inherent contradictions and we often confuse things, right? That you know we want to make great work and therefore <coughs> It might not appeal to everybody. That's okay. You can be inclusive and seconded. You don't have to be all things to all people, because then you do risk dumbing it down. And, and then I have, I have a, a, a set of sort of ironies that I think I've learned about our people. We often confuse being busy for being effective. We often say if we just work harder, we'll do better. Um, we often confuse um, our sincerity of intent with actually having an impact. Um, and we often assume that if we're well-intended, it will drive results. And we want people to accept all of that. We just want them to take it for granted. We're busy, we're sincere, and we're well-intended. Well, I'm back to, okay, so that's what? Why? Why? And so I think that's the last one. About, about the why, and, and if every if every decision goes through a why stream, it makes it much easier to make include and exclude decisions than if it's just a what stream. Sid, so I think you said it also depends where you are, and you know us pretty well in Australia. Is there anything particular that you think characterizes this place that you? So I, I've been eight places, so you're giving me more credit than no you are. Um, I, I do listen and I've been I've been in far north Queensland. It took me it took me um, ten days to learn that's what FNQ meant. And they were constantly talking about FNQ and I'm like that. Ah. Um, but finally asked. Um, uh, I think place is really, really important. Sydney as is as different from Cairns as Darwin is. Relevance is, a, is an overused word in our, in our sector sometimes, but place defines the environment in which you're trying to make the work that you're trying to make. Um, uh, it, it, it's not to say that stuff can only be from a place, but, when, but that's certainly one path. But when stuff comes to a place, it needs to understand place. Um, it, it probably needs to explain things that in some places that it might not need to explain in other places. Um, one of the interesting things, a big conversation at, at one of the conferences I was at was about the state, uh, the state enabled touring programs of sort of the companies from the capital cities. Um, and there was a really interesting comment made by one of them that shall remain nameless. After, after eight companies went along and said, well, we're bringing this to you, we're bringing this to you, we're bringing this to you. The ninth one said, we are coming to you and we would like to know what you would like us to do. Talk about a contradiction. I almost fell out of my chair. 
company is a very traditional, we would think of it as a very traditional genre, but that's exactly the right question. And then they can use all their skills and all their tools in their form at the most highest quality version they can do to be relevant to that place. And I guarantee you their extension, their extension will grow. Now I'm going to ask one more question and then I'd like to throw, throw to you for a bit. Um, how do I put this? In our emerging strategy paper that Wendy talked about, we have a discussion paper out. Um, and we talk quite a bit uh, around this notion of public value. And interestingly, I was with a couple of colleagues at a World Summit for Arts and Culture, which was really a collection of other cultural agencies, funding and otherwise. Uh, in Kuala Lumpur about 10 days ago. And there are a host of different challenges depending on the scale and maturity of these different cultural agencies. But amongst the ones that have been around for a bit longer, so Canada Council, Arts Council England, Australia Council, New Creative New Zealand, uh, some of the Scandinavian councils, it was very obvious we weren't alone in suddenly thinking about public value as being a strategic necessity for the arts sector. It must it is obviously related to your why form. You have a lot of these councils converging at exactly the same time on this phrase. And I'm not convinced we really know what we mean it mean by it. So I was very interested in a couple of your slides. So really this is an invitation to expand a little on this notion of public value and even to how we might evaluate this, because certainly uh, part of it is economic, part of it is a value that is not economic. Is there, is there more you could say to us about how to develop our thinking around, around this notion, which seems to be getting greater traction, not just here? So, so <coughs> Trevor, I have to ask you a question first to just sure. get it out of the room. Is there anybody there from America? Uh, good question. There was someone there from the NEA. Definitely not. Well, you know they've been written out of our 2020 budget by our current president. We'll talk about that later. There's no, no American people. Just get that out. Um, so, you know, it, it, public value is, um, is generally described in soft terms in the, you know, the research that I've read. Um, um, I can think, I can, I can help help a, a little bit, and then like you, I'm in search of the indicators. Um, so here are a couple of things that I've been through or I've, I've read about that I know. Um, in our anchor work in New Jersey, um, we, 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 were, we received some research that had been done when the Performing Arts Center was developed. So I don't know how many of you know Newark, New Jersey, but it had giant race rights in the late 1960s um, and had very little investment since except for the Prudential Insurance Company, some courts, some medical institutions at Rutgers University. Um, and, 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 and that condition was manifest actually in their architecture where they built buildings with defensible perimeters. You could read in the, in the newspaper this concept of defensible perimeters. So when NJ Pack was realized, which was the work of three governors and all kinds of senators and decade process, um, the Performing Arts Center went out and asked its marketplace, what their perspective was after its first year of operation, or maybe the second year of operation. Um, and, and Newark's also an interesting demographic geography. Um, the, the city core is what you would think of, uh, of as a disinvested American city core with a lot of less well-to-do people, a lot of poverty, a lot of school lunch vouchers, um, not a lot of diversity, very much people of color centric. And on the outside of that are the white suburbs and the people that left the city. Um, the data came back, um, and, and they looked at it geographically. And the data for the suburbs said that 84 to 85 percent of the respondents thought that NJPAC had, had given them a sense that Newark was a better place. It was a place they could be more proud of and participate in. That the population that lived in the nine wards that made up the center of Newark 92% of them said that the presence of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center 
and the programs in the city, which they had started community engagement programs five years before the building opened. They worked in all nine boards. They were in education, they were in lifelong learning. <coughs> given them a better perspective of the value of New York. So that's definitely one measure. How do people perceive the place they're in? Is it a place they want to be? Is it a place where they feel they can be successful, where they have, where they have opportunity? Um, competitiveness is another measure. Um, this is a really complicated part, and I've certainly seen it in all the major cities I've seen here, been to here in Australia. Um, who's attracting more of what? Um, whether it's the work, the visitor, the resident. Um, there's an economic dimension um, uh, uh, to public value. Um, and then I think I think this miles per mile person is, is another another piece. And I hope I haven't made that story up. Maybe somebody's from town here in Australia, but it came across a, a news wire at one point. But the notion of do people feel like their well-being is improving because of what they have access to? Yes, and well, certain prime ministers actually uh, confronted their treasury with that challenge about measuring well-being as part of uh, their financial investment. <laughs> <laughs> so, can can I ask now? Are there any questions, comments, discussion starters in the room? Oh, somebody be great. Yes, sir. Oh, one there, one there, and then. Oh, thank you very much. Right Would you mind telling me who you are? Just because? okay. I'm Michael Fortescue. I'm a musician, and I'm here from Tasmania. And uh, I uh, have been involved with the Australian Council for many years ago, quite a lot, and involved with this kind of discussion from 30, 40 years ago, I suppose, something like that. One of the things, I agree with 95% of the things that you say, by the way, uh, and especially knowing that you've got a connection to boxing, I'll, I'll uh, be very kind about that. However, the 5% is really kind of important, and maybe a lot of the things you've said are based on something that I don't really entirely agree with, and that's to do with seeing this moment in history as being the most changeable time in history. That develops, a, I think, not in you particularly, but in me, uh, a kind of self-obsession and a, a tendency to think that we are now, this is the most important time, this is the most dramatic time, this. And that speed of change is in some way indicative of certain qualities. The, the speed that the thing changes is, to me, neither here nor there. That, that in the same year, 1945, it took them three weeks to raise one Air Force to, to, to raise one German city, and a few months later, it took them three minutes to raise one Japanese city. The result is more or less the same, regardless of the time that it takes. And so I also think that the slight obsession in, the, in current thinking about the speed of change and the dramatic nature of change forces us into a kind of adolescent way of thinking. Excuse me, I'm not <laughs> aiming that at you. <laughs> into a sort of simplistic and sort of phenomenal way of thinking about you know, how many Sydney harbors you can fit into Lake Superior or you know, these kind of metric things that we get involved in. And fortunately, the, the results of your thinking, I agree with. But I would arrive there through a different, <laughs> different path there. there. I, I, I think. But so I just wanted to kind of explore that, particularly as Adrian had then added that we are changing with, I think you said, the speed of sound, which I think you meant very fast. And that is that a, the real thing that we're talking about? Uh, the only thing I would say is I think that's why uh, I think that's very interesting, and I think it's why my first question was. What's the why behind why? You know, the, the, this is becoming a very common and important conversation that we have to go to purpose. Uh, and I'm very interested in the way we're either perceiving it or what the reality is that's driving the question. Either way, I get back to your 95%. We have to have a very good response to it. But I think it's a it's a question that could help our, our thinking about the response if we can get some clarity from it. So, so I, come at it, I come at it a little differently, and I actually think you 
put your finger on the thing that I worry about. I think there is great risk of adolescent thinking, simplified thinking around um, measures. Um, I think, and, and maybe it's, throughout history there have been moments when the, the sort of scale of change is, is world changing, the wheel, the atomic bomb. Um, I think, and I think, I think in those moments, they are the most significant change that community, whichever communities you want to talk about, has seen in the moment. Um, I think that right now, um, rate of change can't be undersold. Um, access, democratic access to information and knowledge like we've never had. Certainly when the first book got printed, the game changed. This is just a, this is a uh, different scale of a similar phenomenon. Um, and, and I think sometimes we have to put vocabulary around the moment that shines a bright enough light on the moment so we actually address the complexity of the change. And, and in the interest of time, I've got five or six slides out of the front of this that went to that question. Because especially in the arts and culture sector, you know, it's the, it's the place I know most. There are more pieces in motion, what we do, how we do it, why we do it, for who we do it, how we pay for it, than there have been in the period that I'm around long enough to have experienced or, or, or studied. Um, so, so again, I'm delighted that we're 95% aligned and I think both of the perspectives are really important because we should, we should probably look to other seminal moments of change for some solutions, because no, another, another, my, I, I've told everybody this, my second book will be All Clichés Are True. Um, I haven't written my first one, but, but my second one. Um, I'm the son of a consultant. My dad happened to work in a warehouse, so it has nothing to do with what I do. But what he told me when he found out this is what I was gonna do, is he said, Stephen, remember, there are few new ideas and lots and lots of better implementation. So I think we can learn from those moments before, and apply it to this particular set of conditions. And if we do that really well and, and be thoughtful at the same time, we might come out with a positive outcome. Somebody over here. Yes, um, Ruth Rechler, Professor in Arts, leading So, um, 
there's a construct by the UN uh, Global Development uh, Office um, about the notion of about sustainable development. Um, uh, and they talk about um, they talk about not viable, viable, sustainable, and vital. And in our sector, unfortunately, we got real wrapped up in the notion of sustainability. Um, sustain, how many of you, you must all travel a little bit, you know those things where you throw a coin in the airport and the thing it looks like a funnel goes around and around and around, around long enough to keep a three-year-old's attention, and then the coin goes down. Sustainable means, by definition, by definition, um, that the organization is under-resourced to adapt and change. It means it can continue to do what it's done, but it can't adapt and change. Maybe it can deliver on mission, but it can't adapt and change. What we need to pursue is vitality. Vitality is about having the ability to deliver on purpose, all of you, access to adequate resources, human leadership and financial, to adapt and change, and the ability to generate some kind of internal return on those resources to become not just self-perpetuating, but to have the ability to grow and change. Now why, so, so I'm not sure that was exactly your question, um, if your sustainable question is about will we have actors and teachers and directors and filmmakers and, and will we have the skills we need to make the work, that's not my expertise. Um, but when I look at organizational systems, which require all of those things, and so on people like you, to make sure the resources are, are there, then the question is how do we apply those resources Heritage organizations. We use we use legacy organizations. One of the challenges of being one of those organizations is that trying to just be what you were yesterday, tomorrow, is an incredibly resource resource intensive practice. And then when you deal with change, whether it's the most dynamic of all time or just this time, you look around and you say, who else is supposed to do the work? And in the arts and culture sector, where we have a fundamental undercapitalization of resources, and we rely on human capital to make up the gap in a lot of time. You create all kinds of stress, and then you get to fail, and you get to some pretty capitalistic failure. So that's why I don't, uh, and, and I had a great conversation with a former chair of one of your major performing arts centers who said, we just don't use vitality here. Sustainability means the same thing, and so if we mean the same thing, about the ability to adapt and change, the ability to be adequately resourced, to go beyond delivering on mission and the ability to create some self-perpetuating capacity, then we mean the same thing, and I think it's great. Is that fair? We'll talk about it later. Okay. Um, you said that one of my sure there are physical constraints, right? If we're making a building, we have to hold it up, and that creates walls, and walls are barriers. It's been only fairly recently that we figured out glass is transparent. That might be helpful. Um, there's a lot of art centers around the world that are sort of built from a bad architecture or bad water catalog. Um, uh, they're just brutalist kind of structures. We don't do them very often, so you don't get to fix them. We carry that legacy with them. Um, in West Kowloon, um, uh, at the first building to open is the Sichuan Field, which is the Chinese opera theater. Um, and the architect, uh, late architect being Tom, was confronted with that very question. Um, this may be close to the first one. The building is open to the elements on three sides, 24 hours a day, 366 or 365 days a year. Um, you can enter it and circulate through it engage with it at will. Um, that's the first question. You know, we have security issues. I mean, we've always had security issues. Now we have desperate security issues that we have to deal with. We have functional issues. Um, uh, 
uh, in, in the arts and culture sector. Um, we like to do a lot of what we do to get ready behind closed doors where people can't see things. Um, these are really, really difficult questions, and, and I, do, I don't have the slightest idea what the answer is. I, all, all I've been able to do with my design friends, whether they're actually in the building making side of the world or in the art making side of the world, is say, these are questions I don't know the answers. You guys are the creative ones. Help me think. Um, uh, we have to get over, we have to get over the edifice complex. It doesn't mean we can't build a great building. It doesn't mean we can't build a great building. But, but um, Bilbao was an amazing piece of architecture in a museum. Why did we need 15 more of the same solution? I've asked Frank Gehry that question, right? You know, why, why don't you move it to the next thing? What did you learn from that one? I don't, I don't have a good answer. Um, uh, lots of people, for theater in particular, which is a space I know best, people harken back to the notion that, that our head is always this big, people want to gather around it, they want to see if we have more people, we put them this way, we put them that way, all of a sudden we have a box. Um, we have a forum that respected a fourth wall for a very, very long time. So the, 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 the thing that's happening most in theater buildings around the world now is they're ripping the seats out of them taking the seats out of the first floor, let people stand. You know, people want to be able to move, they want to be close, we have to deal with that. That's even harder than letting people take drinks into the auditorium. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a good answer. Uh, that's one more question, if we have one. Intersectionality of the players who are who are who are making um, art today, and I have a really really broad definition of, of what art is. Um, it's happening everywhere I've been, um, and it's happening at all scales. It's it's uh, Honda Opera on the Harbor scale. It's at a porch concert scale. Um, it's in a jewelry making lesson in a retail shop. Um, I, I have an artist friend. Um, Actually, not probably mentioned as a social commentator, very involved in the UN, um, particularly with refugees. So, um, she would describe herself um, as a storyteller that works at the intersection of big data and augmented reality. We would all recognize her as a dancer. I think that's probably, or, or a performance artist. Um, but she, Natasha Toxis is her name. Um, she brings so many current and, and future streams into the making of her work that it's never the same twice, except that it's spent. Um, and I think that's happening all over the world. That's what makes me excited. It, 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 so so um, I wanted to wrap up, and I'll give you the last word, but it, I want a couple things I'm, I'm out with uh, some things I heard in Kansas, I speak, but, but I, um, I saw some uh, young people uh, doing a uh, performing arts piece drawn on old indigenous storylines from countries where they were from. Young, young kids, 10, 11, 12, 13 kids. Um, um, and it was incredibly moving and very contemporary and very old at the same time. And that gives me a ton of, of happiness that, that we actually can do that. We can, we can be here and relevant and engaged and vital in the best possible way, and at the same time, respectful and honoring and traditional. Turns out this 11-year-old who was the centerpiece of this dance, young man, Mitchell, whose grandfather was there. Um, and, and I apologize, I don't know, I don't know um, his community's name, but we had a really interesting conversation about why he was there 
by his grandson who is involved in this work, and there's, there's part of the tragedy to that, and part of the incredible happiness to it. But he said two things to me that, that I actually wrote down because I wanted to get on right. faster and never to this game. Um, he's an indigenous man from Queens. He said, Stephen, the reason that this is important is because, and, and I asked a question about how, how, how have they been working, how have they gotten this together, it was two companies of young people who came together for this one evening. He says, Stephen, you're, you're looking at it wrong. It's not about what you put into it, it's about what you get out of it. And it was just like, duh, why, why? It's not what you put into it, it's what you get out of it. But duh, that's what um, and then I saw him again later in the evening. His his um, his grandson had come up with two friends, and we were having a conversation. And he's a really good didgeridoo player at 11 years old, mind blowing artist. And we were having a conversation, um, and somehow or another, it led to what I've been doing in town. And I was meeting with all these regional art centers, and we were having really good conversations. Um, and, and he looked at me and he said, so Stephen, did you talk about governance? I'm like, yeah, well, of course, you know, we're talking about governance, but what do you mean? He said, well, well how many of the boards have, have an indigenous man on their boards? Um, I thought that was an interesting and slightly obvious question that I was kind of getting set up. And he paused two or three beats, didn't wait for an answer for me at all. He said, do you know why it's important? He said it's important because an indigenous person can tell you the dreams that are in your heart. And it was like, bam! Why? Why was his grandson part of this performing arts troupe in a way that I could never describe to anybody? And, and by the way, because many of you will know this, we were at the Tanks Art Center, which is perhaps one of the most creative building solutions I've seen in the sector because those buildings were never meant to be performance spaces and visual arts galleries, and they've been adapted in the most incredibly creative way. They've, they've engaged the most incredible range of performance, the best of Australia, with the best of Cairns, the best of the world, the most interesting, the most unusual. And, and I walked away from that evening with a little bit of the answer to the question about what's our purpose. So I'm really, really good. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's very encouraging uh, to have you uh, spend this time with us. And thank you to our university colleagues. I know there are at least three universities, maybe more. I don't think this is just because I spent my last six years working at a university, but it is a real ambition of the Australian Council to work more closely uh, with the universities. Rebecca and Rachel are leading our research effort. Uh, we know we'll only be as persuasive as our evidence base in future. So it's very encouraging uh, to have, have you attend this and we hope to work more closely with you. Part three, Andrew, in response to your question about buildings, universities love to build things, as I discovered. Very <laughs> <That's laughs> building machines. Every dean of every faculty doesn't feel they've done their thing until they've got their building. However, having said that, I think some of the most interesting thinking going on about how you make buildings fit for purpose is happening at universities because pedagogy is changing in such a so you know the new conservatorium at the University of Melbourne just thinks differently about music participation and instruction and it's no accident that it's actually within the creative industry precinct um, or arts faculties thinking about object-based learning and how that how that starts to influence your physical environment. Uh, universities are fortunate that they can make these big investments and make them often, but it would be a good place, as in many things, to start, start um, provoking your thinking around what 21st century venues uh, would look like. So thank you, Stephen, and, uh, for your provocations and for your insights. And again, thank you all for being here. I think we've got some more food and drink to follow, so please. Uh, I, I have two favors. One, I'd love to continue the conversation. That's Wolf at Dan, that's dash online.com. If you're ever in my neck of the woods, and I'm there, not here, I'd um, love to connect. Love to connect here. Um, and I would love some three best photos because my office has said, my office says, if I don't tweet something from here, they're going to shoot me on my <laughs> um, So, uh, 
Thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to continuing the conversation.